Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start, at the very least, on my review of On The Come Up by Angie Thomas. So Angie Thomas, the author of The Hate You Give and uh, Concrete Rose. This is the third of the book of her books that I've read. Um, they're all set in the same place, but with different sets of characters. I'm just going to go ahead and read you the blurb, then I'll go through and check out some of my tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... From the visionary Angie Thomas comes a story about hip-hop, prejudice and fighting for your dreams. 16-year-old Bree wants to be one of the greatest rappers of all time. It's hard to get your come-up though when you're labelled trouble at school and your fridge at home is empty after your mum loses her job. But Bree's success is all that stands between her family and homelessness, so she doesn't just want to make it, she has to, even if it means becoming exactly what the public expects her to be. So let's go through, check some of these tabs out. So here we get like a little tie in a reference to the events of The Hate You Give and also we learn about uh, the let out. Uh, basically this is where uh, hopefully Brie is going to get her her her, uh, her come up I guess, her first big hit anyway as a rapper. Jimmy's parking lot is almost filled up but not everybody is trying to get in the building. The let out has already started. That's the party outside that happens every Thursday night after the final battle in the ring. For almost a year now folks have been using Jimmy's as a party spot. Kind of like they do Magnolia Avenue on Friday night. See, last year a kid was murdered by a cop just a few streets away from my grandparents house. He was unarmed but the grand jury decided not to charge the officer. There were riots and protests for weeks. Half the businesses in the garden were either intentionally burned down by rioters or were casualties of the war. Club Envy, the usual Thursday night hotspot, was a casualty. The parking lot clubs are not really my thing. Partying in the freezing cold, I think not. But it's cool to see people showing off their new rims or their hydraulics, cars bouncing up and down like they don't know a thing about gravity. The cops constantly drive by, but that's the new normal in the garden. It's supposed to be on some high, I'm your friendly neighbourhood cop who won't shoot you type shit, but it comes off as some, we're keeping an eye on your black asses type shit. So she's a big Star Wars fan, she's wearing a Darth Vader hoodie, and uh, Reggie motions are through. May the force beam you up, Scotty. He points at my hoodie, then does the Vulcan salute. How the hell do you confuse Star Trek and Star Wars? I don't think he did. I, you know, I think it's just a meme that people do when they pretend to confuse Star Trek and Star Wars. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. So hours after the battle, she has a nightmare. Um, I'm five years old, climbing into my mum's old Nexus. Daddy went to heaven almost a year ago. Aunt Pooh's been gone a couple of months. She went to live with her and mummy's auntie in the projects. I lock my seatbelt in place and mummy holds my overstuffed backpack toward me. Her armour has all these dark marks on it. She once told me she got them because she wasn't feeling well. So uh, yes, obviously her mum used to be an addict. And her mum sort of takes her to tasks for getting um, crappy grades at school, she says. Only C's I want to see are pictures of C's. The only D's I better see are D's grades improving. I like that. That was, that was fun. She talks about her when she sort of started to have feelings for the opposite sex, which I thought was interesting, and she's talking about wrestling, which is always good. All these feelings started when we were 10. I have this real clear memory of us wrestling in Malik's front yard. I was The Rock and he was John Cena. We were, we were obsessed with wrestling videos on YouTube. I pinned Malik down, and while sitting on top of him in his front yard, I suddenly wanted to kiss him. It freaked me out. So I punched him and said in my best The Rock voice, I'm laying the smackdown on your candy ass. Basically, I tried to ignore my sexual awakening by imitating The Rock. Relatable. And we get this little conversation here. Trust, I basically walk around with an invisibility cloak on. A what? Scrap asks. I stare at him. Please tell me you're joking. It's some nerd shit, Scrap, Aunt Pooh says. Um, excuse you, but Harry Potter is a cultural phenomenon. Scrap goes, oh, that's the one with the little dude with the ring, right? My precious, he says in his best column voice. I don't know, I, I get people making mistakes, but it just feels overdone here. Like, these are, so, as she says, it's a cultural phenomenon. I, I think people would know that you know maybe that's just me being ignorant of black culture I, d I don't know but it's like it's like if i got you know biggie and tupac confused or something you, you just don't they're cultural icons and here we get the come up defined that's what we call our goal the come up it's when we finally make it with this rap stuff i'm talking get out the garden and have enough money to never worry again make it and we get the interesting sort of quandary of aunt poo is dealing drugs even though her sister Bree's mum you know, used to be an addict. And we get a reference to Brie rocking the Juicy Special. Way back when I had the red and black lumberjack with the hat to match. That's obviously a two-pack song. Uh, it's not, I'm just doing a call back to earlier. I'm not ignorant, I promise, I like, I like rap. Oh yeah, we keep getting references to Dat Cloud, which is, you know, presumably the equivalent of SoundCloud. Um, 
she got a track ready and she's not sure what to do with it. She says, I haven't uploaded it online. One, I don't know what to do with it. How do I promote it? I do not want to be that random person on Twitter going into threads and dropping that cloud links that nobody asked for. Two, as dumb as this will sound, I'm scared. To me, it's like putting nudes online. Okay, maybe that's a stretch, but it's like putting part of me out there that I can't hide again. And yeah, I get that. That's what it's like releasing a book as well. You get a reference to Jerry Curls, which I think are, you know, again, another little cultural thing. Um... Some of the deacons are over to the side, including Deacon Turner with a jerry curl. My stank eye is strong for that one. A few months ago, he got up in front of the congregation and ranted about how parents don't need to hug and kiss their sons because it makes them gay. So here we get um, grandma's head swells. You've got to be careful with church compliments, though. The person is probably thinking the exact opposite of what they're saying, but saying something nice in case Jesus is listening in. Her granddad uh, tells her as well like, that she jumps to conclusions faster than lice jump between white kids' heads. Which is pretty fast. And Bree says, That's something only my granddaddy would say, but he may have a point. The first time he said that I was nine, and he just told me and Trey that he had diabetes. I burst into tears and cried, They're going to cut your legs off and you're going to die. So here we learn the differences between Bree and her mum. Uh, her mum is Jay, but she just calls her Jay rather than mum. I swear we can't go anywhere without her striking up a conversation with a complete stranger. Jay's a people person. I'm more of a yes people exist but that doesn't mean I need to talk to them person. And Trey and Bree load up a Michael Jackson video game on the Wii that uh, their dad bought when they were younger. Uh, which is fun because I've been playing a lot of Wii with my girlfriend. But I wasn't aware of a Michael Jackson game. So anyway her friend Sonny who is gay, um, he's been chatting to a lad. But he's never met up with him. And he gets a text saying do you want to meet up? And um... She goes, holy shit, there's one problem though, why haven't you responded? I don't know, he says. Part of me is like, hell yeah. The other part feels like this shit is too good to be true. What if he's really a 50-year-old man who lives in his mom's basement and has a malicious plot to murder me and leave my body parts spread out across his backyard, unknown to anyone, until 20 years from now when a stray dog sniffs me out? Um, which is dark, but this is the kind of thought that I have because I watch too much true crime. So uh, anyway, there's a conversation between her and uh, Bree, Supreme, who is our manager, and Supreme's son, Miles. Uh, Supreme says, you know who the biggest consumers of hip-hop are? White kids in the suburbs, Miles answers dryly, as if he's heard this before. Exactly, white kids in the suburbs, Supreme says. You know what white kids in the suburbs love? Listening to shit that scares their parents. You scare the hell out of their folks, they'll flock to you like birds. So they're talking about the greatest hip-hop uh, artists. I'll just read all of this out, but again, I find this hard to uh, believe that this guy who loves hip-hop hasn't heard of Rakeem, but anyway. Damn, you're a serious hip-hop head. All right, who are your top five could-be goats? Easy, I say, in no order. Remy Ma, Rhapsody, Kendrick Lamar, J. Cole, and Joyner Lucas. Solid. Who are your top five goats, then? Okay, disclaimer, I actually have ten, but I'm going to keep it to five, I say, and Curtis chuckles. Again, in no particular order, Biggie, Park, Jean Grey, Lauren Hill, and Rakeem. He frowns, who? Oh my god, you don't know who Rakeem is? Jean Grey either, he says, and I nearly have a heart attack. The Rakeem name's familiar though. He's one of the greatest to ever touch a mic. I'm probably a little too loud. How in the living hell can you call yourself a hip-hop head and not know Rakeem? That's like a Christian not knowing John the Baptist, or a Trekkie not knowing Spock, or an HP head not knowing Dumbledore. Dumbledore, Curtis. So Supreme says his son, uh, he can't fo focus worth a damn lately. And that's at the point that I realised that he was the person that uh, Sonny had been talking to. So conversation between Bree and her mum. Um, you got food stamps, but you said we weren't gonna. You can say a whole lot before things happen, she says. You never truly know what you will or won't do until you're going through it. We needed food. Welfare could help us get food. But I thought you said they don't give college students food stamps unless they have a job. I withdrew from school. She says it as casually as if I asked her about the weather. You what? I'm so loud, nosy Miss Gladys next door probably heard me. But you were so close to finishing, you can't quit school for some food stamps. And it's just crazy that that's the system. That she is forced to quit education so that she can eat. And Bree's mum takes a, a day off uh, the church gossip as Trey puts it. And Bree thinks, I get it, church is full of people with plenty to say and nothing to do. You'd think some of them would help us instead of talk about us. But I guess it's easy to say you love Jesus and harder to act like him. So Sonny used to have a crush on Trey, uh, Bree's older brother, and she goes, Sometimes I think he's still got a crush on Trey. Trey's always known that Sonny likes him, he just laughs it off. Back when Sonny and I were in fifth grade though, one of Trey's friends said something about Sonny using a word I refused to repeat. After that he was no longer Trey's friend. At 16 my brother was calling toxic masculinity one hell of a drug. He's dope like that. That is pretty dope, good lad. And we get here, middle-aged white woman, Karen Pittman. Ironic that her name is Karen. Uh, so there's a sort of a meeting at the school with uh, all of the parents invited. 
and Karen shows her racism here. Hi, my name is Karen Pittman, she says. This is not so much a question, but a comment. I currently have a 10th grader here at Midtown. This is my third child to attend this wonderful school. My oldest son graduated seven years ago before the various initiatives were put into place. During his four years here, there were no security guards. This will probably be an unpopular comment, but I think it must be pointed out that security measures were only heightened once students were brought in from certain communities, and rightfully so. Aunt Shell turns all the way around in her seat to look at this woman. I wish she would. Oh, I wish she would. She basically did. Everyone knows what she means. There have been weapons brought on campus, Karen claims. Gang activity. If I'm not mistaken, Officers Long and Tate recently app apprehended a drug dealer on campus. She's so mistaken, it's funny. And gang activity. The closest thing we've had to a gang war was when the musical theatre kids and the dance kids tried to out flash mob each other. Shit got real when they both did numbers from Hamilton. And, um... Yeah, the gang, uh, the drug dealer on campus that was apprehended, that was Brie. She got tackled to the floor because she was selling candy. Ridiculous. And here, again, some deep thoughts. I'm always weird about new people, I guess. The more people in your life, the more people who can leave your life, you know. I've lost enough as it is. A little paragraph here that made me chuckle. I stare straight ahead. If you look an angry black mama in her eyes, there's a chance she will turn into a pillar of salt on the spot like old girl in the Bible. And so, yeah, then it gets revealed that it was Malik who Sonny was speaking to, which is a bit obvious. And uh, they end up moving back into the grandparents' house, and um, this, this makes me chuckle. Mom moves around my room. She picks up one of my stuffed Tweety Birds. I hadn't realised I hadn't been in here before. Wait, I take that back. I was definitely in here when it was your daddy's room. Wait, you're saying that you two had sex in the room that ended up being Bree's room, Trey asks. There goes my appetite. Ew. Trey, stop, says Mom. They probably changed the bed. Oh my god, she just confirmed that they did have sex in here. Trey falls onto the bed, screaming, laughing. Brie got the sex room. I also like there that she's calling her mum by that point, and that kind of shows the way that their relationship has developed. And it's quite subtle, because that's told from, you know, the, the, the novel is told from her point of view. So, it's not highlighted that she started calling her mum, rather than uh, Jay. It's just there as a little Easter egg for you as the reader to pick up on. Kind of, again, as their relationship develops, and they, you know... Get, get a bit closer I guess after all those years so yeah on the come up by Angie Thomas I do think it's the weakest of her three novels that I've read I mean I did still enjoy it I guess it's part of it is because I'm so attached to the characters from the other series now the hate you give and concrete rose especially Maverick Maverick is a G um, but yeah on the come up I did still enjoy it good characterization good plot good stuff in terms of um, you know highlighting racial inequality opening up some of the dialogues that we need to have as a, as a society I gave on the come up by Angie Thomas a four out of five so there you have it that's what I made of on the come up by Angie Thomas as always don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video thanks a lot bye bye